So what is the duty of a newspaper in those circumstances? Is it to keep up people's morale? Or is it to do the much more difficult job going against the grain of popular opinion and looking for the truth? It takes balls to sit in front of a world leader and just hold them accountable. On that sign, it read, no war, don't believe the propaganda, they're lying to you. I believe in disseminating the truth, and that is why, after this newscast, I'm resigning. Without truth, you can't have trust. Good morning, everybody. I'm Tina Brown, and I hope you can all hear me over the crashing masonry of media platforms and decimated newsrooms all around us. We are the counter-programming today. Please <laughs> make raucous use of our social media handles. We make a big noise. So welcome to an event that has been so long in the planning and enormously exciting to work on. Truth tellers the inaugural Sir Harry Evans Global Summit in Investigative Journalism. Named for my late great husband, whose passion to get at the truth propelled his entire life, and whose work you'll get to know a little bit about today. First, the genesis of all this. When Harry died in 2020 at the age of 92, and I was pondering what to do to honor his legacy, my first call was from to David Thompson, the chairman of Thomson Reuters and grandson of the great Roy Thompson, who owned the Sunday Times when Harry did some of his landmark investigations. David enthusiastically backed the idea of a legacy project, as did Stephen Hasker, the CEO of Thomson Reuters itself, where Harry spent 10 years in New York as editor at large. And then we partnered with another hugely important institution in Harry's life, Durham University, his beloved alma mater. And presto, with the additional support of friends like Sir Howard and Lady Stringer and Holly Peterson, the Sir Harry Evans Memorial Fund was born. It makes possible an annual fellowship in investigative journalism to give much needed oxygen to the young Harrys of the future. And it supports today's phenomenal convening of mighty journalistic talents, both on stage and out there in the audience too. So why did this Truth Tellers gathering feel imperative right now. The evidence is all around us, isn't it? Serious journalism is under threat from a perfect storm of competing forces. Misinformation, corporate timidity, legal bullying, escalating authoritarian suppression, the disruptions looming and ever closer of AI. We've all seen how the erosion of fact-based inquiry is a threat to functioning society. And more sinister still, the increasing disregard for the, for the Geneva Conventions in multiple dark corners of the world makes the profession of journalism a mortal risk for those brave enough to pursue it. Today, we're pushing back, as Harry did to his last breath, whenever he was faced with unacceptable excuses for inaction against malfeasance. When he came to talk to the Guardian staff at the age of 81, Alan Rusbridger wrote that he was a picture of an editorial life force, still insatiably curious, still shaking an impatient fist at the world. I love that. One of the things that I most admired about Harry was his intense moral energy that never seemed to flag, and how inventive he was about making people pay attention. His great Sunday Times investigations were storytelling at its best. As an editor, he could do all of it, rewrite the copy, ferret out the falsity, choose and crop the pictures, outwit the lawyers, create the killer headlines, all in the service of one overarching goal, telling us what we should care about. And that's what this summit is all about. Delivery systems have changed from newspapers, uh, from newspapers heydays, but values haven't. We're here today, as Harry did, to defend 
and bolster the rigor of inquiry against the bullies and the distorters and remind everyone why serious journalism is indispensable. Before we start with our program, let me turn it over to the first of my two esteemed summit partners, the fierce and fabulous first edit female editor-in-chief of Reuters, Alessandra Galloni. Here she is. Over to you, <laughs> Alessandra. Yeah, so great. Thank you, Tina. I'd like to begin with a story, a short one. Three years ago, a correspondent of ours in Nigeria was speaking to a contact about military abuses against civilians uh, in the country's northeast, where the Nigerian army was battling Boko Haram. Our reporter wondered out loud during this conversation about women who had been abducted, sexually enslaved by insurgents, and then freed. What did the army do with the freed women, he asked perform abortions? The contact looked shocked. How did you know, he replied. This question unleashed what would become a remarkable investigation that we published last year that uncovered some shocking truths, that the Nigerian army ran a mass secret abortion program forcing at least 10,000 women who had been raped and impregnated by insurgents to undergo forced abortions. And this same military murdered children, shot, smothered, poisoned, sometimes in front of their mothers. The investigation took more than two years. Victims, witnesses, and sources were terrified of reprisals by the military. Our reporters were pretty terrified, too. Hardest of all was gathering the evidence to quantify the atrocities beyond any shadow of a doubt. Now, I raise this work because I think it would have made Harry proud. Not just because of its revelatory power, not just because of its impact, and not just because it gave voice to those without one, as Harry always gave, but because it demonstrates one of Harry's most admirable traits, sticking to it. All of you know about Harry's landmark campaign in 1972 against the makers of thalidomide. But you may not know that in 2014, four decades later, Harry picked up his pen again to return to the story, revealing in a piece for Reuters that new documents raised startling questions about whether Germany's federal government had reached a backroom deal with both the makers of thalidomide and prosecutors in charge of the criminal case. We at Reuters strive every hour, every minute to cover the world in real time, but we also take time to dig deep, to dig long into the world's most important overlooked stories. Harry's example of sticking to it has been a North Star for us as we have built up our investigative journalism unit over the past decade. And that's why we're so thrilled to be co-hosts today of this summit, which will explore so many of the facets, uh, the aspirations, the risks, uh, the crackdowns on, the costs of investigative journalism. And it's an important time to be focusing on this kind of work because journalists are putting their lives, their health, and their freedoms at risk every day to inform the world. Just yesterday, Armand Soldin of the AFP lost his life covering the war in Ukraine. Evan Gershkovich, you saw his photo before, of the Wall Street Journal, has been in a Russian jail for more than 40 days. 362 other journalists are currently, being, are currently in jail around the world, and this is the highest level in 30 years. And the intensifying crackdown on press freedom around the world has created a new breed of exiles, journalists who dared report dangerous truths. Throughout today's varied and rather intense program, we hope to channel the essence of Harry, his curiosity, his cunning, his courage, and above all, his stick to itiveness, which is a true word. Because we plan to stick with investigative journalism, and I hope all of you will too. And now I'd like to pass it to our, our other partner in crime, uh, Karen O'Brien, Vice Chancellor of Durham University.
Thank you. We are enormously proud at Durham University of our alumnus, Sir Harry Evans. Harry studied at the castle between 1949 and 1952, edited the student newspaper The Palatinate, and occasionally found himself talking in pubs to local miners. In his autobiography, My Paper Chase, he gives a vivid account of the magic and quirkiness of his alma mater, and also recounts how he found journalistic inspiration in the Northeast. He edited the regional newspaper, The Northern Echo, knowingly following in the footsteps of Northeasterner and father of British investigative journalism, W.T. Stead. Stead deployed the Echo to expose the hypocrisy and brutality of the Victorian prostitution of women and girls. Harry's Echo campaigned for cervical smear tests for women. Like Stead, he did not shy away from taboo or difficult subjects. My university today is similarly committed to the research and teaching of difficult, urgent issues ranging from gender-based violence to contemporary Russian politics. We are therefore so delighted to play a part in this global summit to affirm the special partnership between investigative journalism and universities and to celebrate our shared commitment to evidence gathering and free inquiry. For if great journalists are truth tellers, Universities are surely truth keepers. Not only are we educators of students and safe guardians of the archive, not only do we maintain expertise in languages, security studies and areas whose public use may only one day become clear in a crisis, and not only do we remind legacy-conscious tyrants and war criminals how the first journalistic draft of history will become the lasting record of all time, and how, as Tacitus wrote, truth is confirmed by inspection and delay. More than this, in our global era of digital noise, we give assurance to journalists in the field that there are observatories on truth, spaces where fake news and fake histories are contested, and where the insights of journalists can be verified. We sustain and connect insights over the long time, and we also evaluate and celebrate how journalists are themselves the makers of history. This was the case in 1971 with the atrocities in East Bengal, now Bangladesh, that Harry was bold enough to name as genocide, and which universities here and across the world continue to document more than 50 years on. The values that Sir Harry Evans embodied continue to inspire students and staff and are as urgently relevant as ever. Let us begin.